Good morning. I'm Ray Roberts. I'm the pastor of River Road Presbyterian Church, and on behalf of a wonderful congregation, I extend you greetings in Jesus Christ. Welcome to this time together this morning. Uh, we've been in a sermon series called Holy Ordinary, and we've been looking at various uh, articles in ordinary life, uh, things like uh, things like shoes and oil. And today, uh, we're going to look at coats. And uh, to help us with that, uh, we're going to look at a passage from Luke 19, beginning with verse 28. Hear the word of God. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King! who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. And he answered them, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would cry out. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. May God bless this reading of Holy Scripture. Amen. So, uh, the crowd was bigger because it was Passover. Archaeologists uh, think that Jesus, in Jesus' day, Jerusalem averaged somewhere between 50 and 30,000 people in population. But at Passover, the city would swell to something like 150,000. It's a lot more people, and that could explain why Jesus uh, spent a lot of his time about two miles away in a little village called Bethany. A lot, maybe most pilgrims, entered the city through the east gate, which is the gate that you would enter from the Mount of Olives. So there were a lot of people there, and when Jesus passed by, the crowd went wild. And Luke tells us, that people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. Now, my question for you is, have you ever seen such behavior? Have you ever seen that? Have you ever, have you ever put your coat on the ground for anybody? I googled it and found only one example. Uh, Sir Walter Raleigh is said to have put his coat over a puddle for Queen Elizabeth, although historians also will tell you they think it's a legend. The only other time I could find this sort of behavior is in first or second Kings rather, chapter nine, verse thirteen, where where it says, Then in haste, every one of them took his garment and put it under him on the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Yehu is king. Laying your coat on the road goes beyond just rolling out the red carpet. It is beyond welcoming. It is an extreme symbol of deference and honor. It was an act of submission paid to royalty. By doing this, the people are saying that Jesus is king. They reinforce this message with their words. Listen again to what the Bible says. As he was approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully, with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen. In other words, they've seen what Jesus has been doing. Healings and exorcisms and feeding the 5,000 and all these different things. And this is why they are excited. And then they say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. 
peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. In word and in deed, the crowds welcome Jesus as king. And if you read the Gospels, you can understand why the crowd was thinking king when they, when they thought of Jesus. Jesus' central teaching was that the kingdom of God was near. And Jesus said a lot of things about the kingdom of God. That the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It's like a treasure hidden in a field. It's like a sower who went out to sow. He said it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Though that the, king is, the kingdom is like a wedding feast that a king threw for his son. With so much kingdom talk, people naturally thought Jesus was king. Now, what is not entirely clear is what sort of king they thought he was. In the book of Acts, which is also written by Luke, the first thing the disciples ask the risen Christ is this, Are you going to restore the kingdom at this time? Even after Jesus' crucifixion, his disciples are thinking of an earthly political kingdom. Now, we know that people in Jesus' day were looking for a Messiah, an earthly Messiah, someone who would break the Roman occupation, throw off the yoke of the Roman oppressor, and establish an earthly kingdom in which they would be free. Indeed, throughout history, people have longed for an earthly Messiah who would bring heaven to earth. And history is littered with people who tried to turn spiritual vitality into political legitimacy or tried to enforce spiritual values through earthly power, kind of approaching the same thing from different angles, trying to get that spiritual legitimacy or trying to enforce spiritual values through earthly power. The pharaohs claimed to be gods. During the time of Christ, the Caesar cult developed, first claiming that Julius Caesar was God and then claiming that Augustus uh, was the son of God. Throughout Chinese history, emperors have sought to claim the mandate of heaven. In Islam, Muhammad embodied both religious and secular power in his person. And through the centuries, religious and secular power were merged in the Caliphate. In recent decades, we've witnessed the rise of political Islam, which seeks to reestablish the Caliphate, who will in turn impose Sharia law. In India, Hindu nationalists came to power by promising to enforce true religion against Muslims and Christians and Buddhists and others. 2,000 years of church history have witnessed a similar sort of dynamic. Secular leaders have sought the legitimacy that religious, religion can, can give, and religious leaders have sought to enforce religious values using secular power. When Constantine converted to Christianity in the 3rd century, some Christians at the time thought that the kingdom of heaven had come to earth. And according to Mennonite theologians, when this happened, Christians traded Jesus for secular power and for beautiful churches. They left the ethics of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and began blessing whatever violence or killing they thought necessary at the time. When the Reformation came, this close connection between religious and secular power led to the wars of religion, the Thirty Years' War, the Hundred Years' War, where people fought to determine whether a particular land would be Catholic or whether it would be Protestant. Now, in the United States, we have a constitution, and our constitution forbids religious tests for office. And we also have a First Amendment which prohibits the establishment of religion and defends the freedom of conscience in matters pertaining to the practice of religion. In recent times, though, in other countries around the world, we've continued to see people blur this line between secular power and, and religious authority. So during World War I, German soldiers wore belt buckles into battle that said, Gott mit uns. God with us. Prior to World War II, German Christians supported Hitler and believed that God had destined Germany to establish a Third Reich. And the corruption of the German Christians led to the establishment of the Confessing Church, the writing of the Barman Declaration, and inspired Christians like Bonhoeffer to resist. 
Today, Russian Orthodoxy is blurring the same line the way the Germans did with the Nazis. They've built cathedrals that mix Christian symbols with military imagery in the heroic stories of the Russian army. The Moscow Patriarch Kirill has blessed the invasion of Ukraine and in a recent sermon claimed that Russia is fighting the forces of the Antichrist in its war. By the way, Orthodox leaders, the Pope and other Christians are really distressed by this and even the Presbyterian Church has written letters and published statements condemning the collapse of this boundary between secular power and religious authority and urging Kirill to resist the war. Now lest we feel too smug, we Americans also have voices that confuse the kingdom of God with America. And you can recognize them whenever the symbols for Christian faith are mixed with national symbols. And crosses and eagles and Bibles and flags are all kind of thrown together. When we, you can recognize this sort of Christian nationalism whenever we talk and act as if a secular leader can say this. As if we depend upon secular power instead of the power of God. Or when we turn the necessities of national defense into a crusade. Whenever Christianity baptizes nationalism, it is toxic for Christianity and dangerous for the world. Now, given the Messianic hope circulating at the time, it is no wonder that the religious leaders tell Jesus to get the crowds to cool it. Tell them to shut up. They knew that the crowds shouting and actions would be a threat to Herod and to Pilate and to Rome. Now, I will also add that the crowd's reaction explains everything that happens from this point going forward in Luke's Gospel. After Jesus is arrested and brought before Pilate, Pilate asks Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replies, You've said so. When Jesus is crucified, the Romans post a sign over him naming the charge. And the charge is the charge of sedition. The sign reads, The king of the Jews. When the religious leaders tell Jesus to quiet the crowds, Jesus says that if the people were silent, the very rocks would cry out. Jesus is saying that although he is not an earthly king, his rule is nonetheless very real, and all creation is rejoicing at his arrival as the rightful king. And then at that very moment, when all the rocks are shouting and all the people are shouting, Jesus does something very unroyal. He weeps. He weeps because we do not know the things that make for peace. What are the things that make for peace? Well, Jesus is going to show us. For he does not lead his crowd into Jerusalem and take power. He is the Messiah, but he does not institute the messianic rule using secular power. He does not crush and vanquish the Romans. He does not rule through violence and intimidation. He rules through love and through service. He turns the way the world operates on its head. And as Luke reminds us over and over, Jesus is headed to the cross, not to a throne. He does not sacrifice others so that he may rule. He sacrifices himself. And when the Romans crucify him, I'm sure they thought that the cross was a big win. The point of all of this is that we who call Jesus Lord, we who believe that Jesus is king, have a very different view of power. We view the world differently. We have different hopes and expectations for secular power. And we know that the Herods and the Pilots finally do not rule this world. Rome, for all of its power, does not hold our destiny. Only God does. And Jesus shows us the things that make for peace. The way of peace is love. He shows us through the resurrection that love is the power of God to break down the dividing walls of hostility and it is stronger than evil 
and it is even stronger than death. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, um, may we uh, be faithful in following the one who is our Lord and our Savior, even Jesus the Christ. And may we resist the temptation to seek earthly power, for we know that you hold all the power on heaven and earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we're so glad that to have you uh, participate this way. Uh, we do thank every one of you who has supported this ministry financially. We could not do it without you. I do have a couple of announcements for this week. Uh, this evening, Sunday night, uh, Palm Sunday night, uh, we are uh, have a concert at 7 o'clock, The Seven Last Words of Christ by Dubois, and I hope you will join us for that. On Wednesday, the 13th, we have an Easter egg hunt. And we also have uh, Wednesday night supper, and uh, there should be some directions on how you can sign up for that. This coming Friday, Good Friday, uh, we'll have a service as well, uh, a Tenebra service, communion and Tenebra. And then next Sunday, Easter Sunday, we'll have an outdoor service at 9 o'clock and a traditional indoor service at 11 with uh, brass and all kinds of great music. So I hope that I will see you there. We'll also, be, of course, be providing services online as well. Now, may the grace and peace of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and with those whom you love and with those who know and love wherever they may be this day, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen.